Hi, and welcome to Soul Care Podcast. We are so glad you're here with us today. I'm Kimberly Willis. And I am Jinda Reinick. We are joined by our soul care expert, Warren Lamb. Hi, glad to be here. We are here to talk about soul care, what it means, what it looks like, and the hope it can offer. Our desire with this podcast is to offer hope for battling some of the greatest struggles we face as humans, and to do so with love, kindness, grace, and prayer. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for this journey into the world of biblical soul care. Let's get started. Okay, so today we are going to dive into depression and suicide, since they often um, have parallels. Um, Warren, do you want to kick us off with reading from the DSM with the the definition for? Do I have to read it? (laughs) Please do. So if you look at page 183 of the DSM 5 TR, uh, it it lays out the major, major depressive disorder. And it starts with the diagnostic criteria. And it's got a lot here but it has nine symptoms listed and it says five or more of the following symptoms have been present during the same two-week period and represent a change from previous functioning at least one of the symptoms is either one depressed mood or two loss of interest or pleasure and then it says do not include symptoms that are clearly attributable to another medical condition so then it starts off with Symptom number one, depressed mood most of the day, nearly every day, as indicated by either subjective report, feel sad, empty, hopeless, or observation made by others, appears tearful, appears melancholy. And it says, no, in children and adolescents can be irritable mood. So in other words, if they're noting that children deal with this differently than adults do. Okay. Second is markedly diminished interest or pleasure in all or almost all activities most of the day, nearly every day. Again, subjective encounter of observation. Three, significant weight loss when not dieting or weight gain, a change of more than 5% of weight month, weight body weight in a month, or decrease or increase in appetite nearly every day. Insomnia or hypersomnia nearly every day. Five is psychomotor agitation or retardation nearly every day, which is observable by others, not merely subjective feelings or restlessness or being slowed down. Five is fatigue or loss of energy nearly every day. Seven is feelings of worthlessness or excessive or inappropriate guilt, which may be delusional nearly every day, not merely self-reproach or guilt about being sick. Eight is diminished ability to think or concentrate or indecisiveness nearly every day, either subjective account or observed by others. And nine is recurrent thoughts of death, not just fear of dying, recurrent suicidal ideation without a specific plan or a symptom, suicide attempt or a specific plan for, for completing. It says committing suicide. We don't use that language. And that says the symptoms cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. And then C, the episode is not attributable to the physiological effects of a substance or another medical condition. And it says criteria A through C represent a major depressive episode. And then it talks about responses to significant loss, which we t- we've talked about before. And basically, it's it's like if you're having real struggles with living daily life. And you have these emotions, these negative emotions or or pressed down emotions that go with that. We're going to call that depression. And it's every day or near all day or nearly every day. So it's an ongoing thing. It's not something you feel today and you're good for a few days. Right. So that's a lot. to. uh, That's a lot. Right. Right off the bat. Right. I feel like that's a pretty heavy definition. So let's take a look at it biblically real quick. Okay. Okay. The Bible talks about a crushed spirit and it talks about deep sorrow. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. We have to understand that what the DSM-5 does 
is all it does is redefine what we already know. All this is is a redefinition manual. So when and you it, talk when you're ahead. talking about you know a crushed spirit and, and the Bible talking about that, can you just speak to a little bit like I think for some people dealing with depression, they're looking at a timeline of oh, I've been feeling this way for so long, I need help now because my life around me is falling apart. Okay. When, when things fall apart, right, we're supposed to be sad about that. Because when things fall apart, that means they are not keeping up with God's original design and created order. They're not matching that. Okay. And depression what they call depression or this crushed spirit, this deep sorrow, has to do with significant loss. Remembering that we were never intended by God to experience loss. So when we experience loss, yes, we're going to be sad about it. And if it's a significant loss, we're going to be significantly sad about it for a while until we're able to sort through and integrate that into our overall story. What we're saying almost is DSM, which we agree. We agree that there can be a level of deep sorrow and crushed spirit that's even biblically speaking, and that there are times where we will face this. Yeah. Like I think that's like if we were to just say, okay, DSM, yeah, we agree there, there's going to be times where life is hard because we live in a world that is imperfect and that was not designed as God created it to be for his people. So now what do we do about that? Right. And those are the differences. Now we could now you can get into the differences of you're going to experience that. I think just, you know, to dispel, hey, life is not going to be perfect all the time. The Bible even talks about the fact that we're going to experience significant loss and it's going to hurt and it's going to be a lot to get through. But we want to help you get through that and not medicate or distract you from being able to work through or exactly or label yourself like um well so let's look at this if you if you're diagnosed with depression they're going to give you a medication right but in um you've heard me talk about dr peter bregan a lot and you will right um um dr bregan wrote a book uh the antidepressant fact book quite a few years ago Right. And in the book, he says, he says that depression is never defined by an objective physical finding like a blood test or a brain scan. What it's defined by is a person's experience with personal suffering, especially by depressed or pressed down thoughts and feelings that that person expresses. So you're talking about what Dr. Berger calls phenomenology experience and they're saying well you're you're describing these experiences so we're going to diagnose you with this mental illness and we're going to prescribe a medication for it but we've done nothing to examine the brain or your your biology or anything else so we're saying we're supposed to be sad we're supposed to experience this this grief when things don't go according to God's plan, God's design. And that doesn't mean we will stay there, but let's say you're getting ready to scramble eggs, right? And you drop one of the eggs on the floor and you're going to feel sad for a second. Oh, right? But that sadness isn't going to last very long. That's a loss, but it's not a significant loss for a long period of time, right? Mm -hmm. But sadness over loss is normal. That's a normal human reaction. If you're going to scramble eggs. You open the refrigerator and realize the refrigerator has not been running for two days. That sadness is going to be deeper and last longer. Mm -hmm. So it's the loss and the significance of the loss and the ramifications of it. How sad are you going to be for how long? Yeah. So you think, so would you say, so someone who ha maybe has chronic depression, they've had a series of losses, right, in their life that maybe that haven't been dealt with. Or, right. or they haven't had someone to walk them through those losses. So it's kind of like 
this yeah. jar, like maybe let's say, and it's in the jar, it just keeps filling up. And, and you're filling it up. You're filling it up with like mud or something. Right. That's- yeah. Right. Where, and then in a sense, like society wants you to get over it quickly. And if you can't get over it quickly, um, let's talk about a little bit of like, oh, okay, you've, you've, you've um, experienced a significant amount of loss and now you're depressed. And um, for instance, I know what, like one time, personally, one time um, I worked with uh, a therapist and he's like, you've had, you, you suffer from depression because you've had so much loss in your life. Um, Your brain the serotonin part of your brain has stopped working. Let's get you on medication so you can understand, so you can just understand what that feels like and get that working. So if someone's going to give that kind of advice and what do you, what do you say to something like that? Well, like we've talked about before, we had that study released last year where researchers, clinical researchers looked at all of the research that had been done on serotonin based depression since the 60s and said there's no empirical evidence supporting serotonin-based depression. So that diagnosis is not based on any scientific data. Which I think this needs to be, and we'll include this in the show notes, because I think this is a very, this is going to be earth shattering for people, some people listening, right? I mean, this is a really big, I was just in a Bible study couple months ago and there's a woman who it's, who's been dealing with depression for about 18 years um and everyone at the table was trying to comfort her with kind of saying well it's not within your control you have chemical imbalances going on in your in your body and that's what's leading to it and that was supposed to be a source of comfort for her as though you know don't beat yourself up over this it's beyond your control. The medication is supposed to help. But as we know now, and as you just shared, not only is that scientifically unproven that there are imbalances, but also on the flip side, the people that are taking the depression medication for long and extended periods of time, they're not feeling better. No, they stay depressed. They stay depressed. Exactly. They're, they're, Wounds are still active. They just n- are numb at times. I mean, the 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 pain is still there. It's, so it's not really doing anything. So and now we're going back to the symptom relief thing. Yeah, we're right. going to we want to feel better, or at least not as bad. But we're not dealing with the underlying brokenness. We're not dealing with the woundedness. We're not right. dealing with the root problem. Right, because people I've spoken to who feel who are depressed and on some type of antidepressant, they just choose to stay on it because the sec they're like the second I get off it, the tears won't stop. Yeah. Good. 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 <laughs> let's grieve. Let's let's do some honest grieving over the significant loss that you've experienced because that's real and true and healthy. It is, but and that's and that's why we are doing this podcast because if you are someone who has been dealing with chronic depression for or not chronic, but you've been dealing with it in a medicated way and you fear that, just as Kimberly said, getting off of the medication, I am in deep sorrow, but no one that you've talked to knows how to help you. You stay on the medication because medicated is better than dealing with something that feels uncontrollable, right? I mean, that those are your options. If you feel at a loss for the right help, It's better to be medicated and numb than it is to be dealing with an extreme level of emotion and and depression that you just have no idea how to climb yourself out of, right? Yeah. So so for instance, Warren, if someone comes to to you and they've been medicated and they're tired of being medicated, but they wanted they want help with depression, what is how do you help them? What is like let's say we have our first meeting. And is that the kind of, is that the kind of uh, people that come that are, hey, I've been on medication, I'm not getting any better? Often, often. 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 Yeah. I just started meeting with a young man. I've met with him twice now over the, over Zoom. 
and he's been, you know, he's been on medication for years. He says, I, I'm tired of feeling like this. I'm tired of, I, I don't feel like myself. I hate the way I feel on this stuff. I said, okay, um, let's talk about the feeling. Let's talk about those feelings that you have when you're not on the medication. Let's talk about what those feelings are. Let's talk about where they're coming from. And, it, and he, oh, nobody had really talked to him about that before. And what's really interesting is that um, he was led to believe what most of us have been led to believe is that we're not supposed to be sad. The sadness is not healthy or normal. One of the things we're going to put in the show notes, one of the references we're going to use is uh, Dr. Uh, um, Daniel Berger's book, Rethinking Depression, Not a Sickness, Not a Sin. Because Daniel does an incredible job of going through and looking at the data from the people who are in that field, right? Um, he, quote, he quotes people like Alan Francis, right? He was the chair of the DSM-4 task force. And he wrote a book called Saving Normal. Uh, Daniel wrote a sequel to that, a response to that called Saving Abnormal, which is incredible. Um, but uh, Francis, Alan Francis says, look, the DSM-4 is a guidebook. It's not a Bible. Um, he, he said it's a, it, it, it's a collection of temporarily useful diagnostic constructs, not a con catalog of real diseases. What? But yet, if you think about it, he says, you experience divorce or illness or job loss or financial difficulties or interpersonal conflicts. You, you can't medicate those away. You've got sadness, you've got dissatisfaction, you've got discouragement. You can't medicalize that, call it a, me a mental disorder, and then treat it with a pill. Right? This is a guy who's the chair of the DSM-4 team, and he says the way we define and diagnose depression doesn't make sense. And why is it? So you, you know, when this gentleman who you just referenced, you've been on medication for a while and you use, and he doesn't like to be on it. He's aware that how it makes him feel. And, and, um, you say to him, okay, well then let's talk about the emotions that, or the, the feelings that you have when you're not on the medication. Why is that earth shattering? Why is that not something that a clinical psychologist or um, psychiatrist, why is that not someone that in a clinical setting, why don't they ask that question? Because he's medicated. So we have to deal with what what's leaking through the medication. Yeah, but why would that, like, so, so why is that not something? Because they're not looking at causes. And don't you think they're addressing symptoms and what you're okay. So they're addressing a symptom. And I think when you give someone medication, let's say with depression, don't you think that compounds the thought of I am the problem versus I have no control over this. I'm a victim of this. Oh, if I only could, had a way to control this, I wouldn't feel so victimized by this. Right. And why then? And I'm sorry if I sound naive, but if I, I know people go to the same doctor in a clinical psychiatry setting for years, why go? What does that visit look like? Help me understand if I've been diagnosed with depression, I'm on medication, I'm seeing the same therapist week after week or month after month, whatever cadence. Why do I keep going? Like, what is that conversation? I know you, you haven't sat in those rooms before, but you've counseled people out of that kind of typical environment. What is, what is that point of that? Or what, I, obviously there's no point. So no disrespect. Well, I can also speak to it in the sense that I've been in, I have been in those rooms. I have gone to, for psychiatric help and I have been given medication. And um, when you go, and Warren, you can tell me, but when you, I've gone personally into those rooms, it's like, Hey, let's check in. How's it going? Are you feeling better? And now looking back, it's like almost in a way, a placebo effect, because mm -hmm. you want, you want to feel better so bad. And, um, you can, yeah, I think it's working and it's more like they just want to, it's all about the medication. Mm -hmm. it, 
especially if you're in a psychiatrist's office, hey, how is it working? And they're trying to figure out the dose, the dosage mm-hmm. for your for your Which brain. There's no science to it. Norm, what's normal? What's the normal range for these chemicals in your brain? No, there's no, there's no standard. There's no measure. Blood right. sugar you can measure, you know, whether that's normal or not, but not brain chemistry because there's no such construct. Yeah, so, yeah, it is all through whatever I'm going to tell, whatever I'm going to articulate my experience to you. Yeah, exactly. It's just self, whatever you self-report, yeah, whatever exactly. you're self-reporting. And then additionally, I mean, we've seen, you know, we've seen exposés of how quickly you could walk into a therapist's office and leave with a medication for. Or five medications. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's not, you You list, you read the DSM in advance, you walk in and you state those symptoms and you could easily get the, the the prescription which so I guess you know you have someone that comes to you that has similar experiences perhaps as Kimberly like I you know had this issue I was on not to to say specifically this is your path Kimberly but got the medication had follow-up appointments kept meeting with someone but it was ultimately a facade that there was no healing going on and healing's not the point Absolutely. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to unpackage the person who arrives at your front door because then they've spent years perhaps in this cycle of medicated treatment, but no results. They've gone to this person believing that that person's agenda and goal is the same as theirs, which is to help them experience healing. That's not the other person's agenda because that other person is not trained for that. That other person is trained to help them relieve their symptoms. And that's what they're looking for is symptom relief. That's the agenda. Yeah. Our goal, our agenda is pro- provide God's healing to the foundational brokenness and woundedness. Mm-hmm. So then this person sits down with you and instead of, instead of taking. I had that conversation today. A woman who has been diagnosed with major depressive disorder and anxiety disorder for over 20 years. Mm-hmm. Wow. So we spoke for an hour and 20 minutes, and she says, you're talking to you for just over an hour than I felt in 20 years. That was the thing she said, I realized I've been seeing this woman for 20 years, and I'm, there's, I'm no, no improvement. I still have the same diagnosis, and they still want me on the same medications. Those medications never make me better. Yeah. So heartbreaking. It so is, heartbreaking. because they really want help. They're going to the people who say, who are self-proclaimed professionals, self-proclaimed doctors. There's no science behind this. Why are you, why, why are you saying that you are, you're, you're this professional because somebody else told you you are? Well, and I think I always like to throw a disclaimer out, which I know you don't warrant, but I think there are people in this profession who that's. They do want to they do. help people. The problem they is they they've been, never been trained to do it. They've, they've been, been improperly been trained. trained yeah. Yes, I think they've been improperly trained. And I don't think um, they've been trained to, to, to fix a symptom, to make someone's life immediate, but no. immediately better. They, they don't, there's not that deeper healing or, or, or looking at the woundedness and yeah. how to walk through that. Yes. Right. And, and that's the thing is that this person, th- this woman wants to help her. This clinician wants to help her, yeah. but she's never been trained, never been provided the tools to actually provide real help. Yeah. I'm sure she's frustrated, true. And it, it, it's really easy to say, I'm either a lousy therapist or my patient just isn't willing to do what? The work. The work. Yeah. Well, what's the, but the thing is, the clinician's what's not going to give her any work. Yeah, it's just to say, well, we need to adjust your meds. But I want to say, like, because I do think there's a movement in mainstream um, psychology where there are there are certain therapists who have come to realize that um, that it doesn't work. They don't see their patients getting better, yeah. and um, and so they there are they are trying to look and find alternatives mm-hmm. where. Um, it's something that you've been, you know, you've been doing for a long time and within, within biblical counseling, but I do find that all of a sudden people are like, oh no, it's a, it's an old wound that I need to heal and I need to work through. And, um, so yeah. there's a, a bit of awareness going on, but I think we should talk about how, um, 
when we work with God and the Bible and, and it's like this transformation, right? Where it's transformation because we're going to talk about how you and God are actually in agreement. And you partner together. Is that what you and God are in agreement that the, the losses that you've experienced were not part of his original plan? Right. Yeah, I think that's I think it's important, you know, to and maybe you have a couple of scenarios you can explain of just this, these people, these two that in particular that you mentioned, this male who you've been working with, this woman today who you have an hour and a half long conversation with. Um, there was obviously some significant loss that they experienced, right? And and to your point of you and God are in alignment, God didn't want that, but sin is in this world and it's around us and brokenness happens. And we have to, we have significant loss. We have deep sorrow. We have a crushed spirit, but God's not, God's with us along the way. So let's, let's work with him to get to the healing on the other side of this, right? So what were like for these two people, what were some of the chronic or, or the the losses they experienced that they over 20 years or you know beyond weren't able to work through? Sure. So the 23-year-old was uh adopted at birth, right? And he was a meth baby. So he had he had some some damage done to the brain. Um and so there's there's loss right there of God's created order for him to be in safe, caring, loving, nurturing relationship with his biological parents who are going to be lovingly married to each other for their entire lives. Okay. That whole thing got disintegrated for him the day he was born. Right. So, yeah, he has an adoptive family, which is plan B. It's not plan A. It is plan B. Which means that there's loss, legitimate loss that's been experienced. That if if he's able to walk through that, and he's able to experience healing and comfort for that. Um, so, real quick on that though, does he yeah. have a healthy? Is it is the relationship with the adoptive family healthy? And it's been for the most part. For the most part, but one of the things we run into with parents, adoptive parents in particular is oftentimes parents, you know this as parents, we have a tendency to focus much more on behavior than the heart behind the behavior, right? You see the pimples on the face and you want to pop them, but there's a there's a problem with the metabolism that's causing these pimples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so this, this little guy's got some, some problems and they're, they're really addressing the behavior and things like that. Nobody had talked to them about ministering to this little boy who has the significant loss that he's not cognizant of. He's not intellectually thinking about it, but it is a very real loss for him. Hmm. And so helping him figure out even what he's feeling and the fact that he ended up being developmentally delayed. Hmm. So even his ability to articulate and to, and to communicate. And they nobody talked to them about paying attention to the pictures he's drawing or the toys he's playing with or how he's playing with them, right? So all of these things that would, would be his way of communicating what's going on with him, they were unaware of. See, no fault of theirs. And so again, they're providing a loving home. They're solid believers, right? Well, as he gets older, um, he runs into not just behavior problems, but now he's running into problems being because of the way he talks and the way he moves and things like that. And not being fast, you could be kind of slow. Now he's being teased and taunted and bullied. So he has all of those dynamics. So there's more loss that goes on, right? And he's he never learned how to, to address those things with God as his partner, right? And he and I've met, I think we've met twice now. We've met twice now. And it's completely up to him where we can, whether we continue to meet. The second after we finish the second time, he says, "Are we going to be? Are we going to meet again?" I said, "That's that's your call. Do you want to?" He said, "I really do," because what he he feels hurt, he feels understood, and he feels encouraged. Mm -hmm. Because he keeps hearing about how the goals that he has in life he can't he can't manage, he can't get mm -hmm. there. They're going to be really, really hard. Yes, they're going to be really, really hard. That doesn't mean you can't get there. 
you it may require more work on your part to get there but the foundational things you are in place for you to be able to get there right you go this kid managed to earn eagle scout do you know what kind of focus and dedication and what kind of planning and i mean he's got all the makings he needs to achieve these goals that he has the first one is to be able to get off his medication mm. right there are some things he has to do in his healing work in his identity in christ and things like that he has to do those things first for the him because when he gets off the medication all of those emotions are boiling over and he has no idea what they are what to do with them mm -hmm. right okay. that's what he and i are going to work on okay. uh, he's, got the make, he's got the makings he's yeah. got the basic framework and i keep telling him i said don't tell me you don't, you can't do this but because you're his, an eagle scout for crying out loud you can right. do this. yeah some of Go the ahead. basics of what we we know to be true in our world when it comes to soul care one of the first is under, understanding your identity in Christ. So if if it starts broken because you're this broke this this perfect union that God has established for the creation of a family unit and, and and the harmony between that family unit is immediately broken and then it starts to put a crack on this this image, right? This image that you have of how you were who you were created to be and who you're creating in the image of God. So it just is compounded for him over 23 years with this well add, add and add to that because he he it was never a secret that he was adopted mm -hmm. and never a secret that his mother had used abuse mm -hmm. drugs. so what does he what does he know as a little kid he knows that his mother loved drugs more than she loved him sure right that's a horrible message to have to carry yeah right and so there must be something wrong with you or she would have been able to love you enough to quit her drugs exactly yeah right and then um, you know, like he and I were talking the other day, compounded loss. Because this isn't my family, my birth family. I'm not really their son. Now, they never said those things, but those are things that he he rolled around in his head. And because he's had such difficulty in school and so many other difficulties and challenges and things, <clears throat> he's become convinced that God doesn't like him. He's become convinced that God made him this way because he wasn't, he didn't intend to love him. So again, identity in Christ, who is God really, right? I, I, I did, I did, I did, uh, nature and character of God, all again, we're back to the same foundational things, same well, foundational things. And I think we even hit on with that in particular, it also goes back to this is a broken world. And so you, this this poor gentleman is potentially, I mean, not potentially, he's definitely broken. His experiences in life are not what God had originally intended for him to experience. But because of brokenness and sin on behalf of his mother and how she used and the what that has caused, that, yeah. that doesn't mean that you are less than desired or desirable, that God didn't love you more. It means that we're in a broken, fallen world. And that's that's hard for um, to be trapped in your own mind and filled with these, these doubts all the time of your worth, if that is an well, You know what, I'm, and I guarantee you that as, as he works on, he's already working on saturating on scripture, already has one passage of scripture. And... Right now, he's reading it out loud three times a day. That's what we're working on. First thing in the morning, at lunch, and last thing at night. Okay. Now, yeah, we're going to build on that. Mm -hmm. But getting him, getting him to believe he can and, and that he does do it three times a day, his mother is like blown away. Right? Yeah. It, it, I said, so what's the verse? And he was able to recite it with a little help. I said, that's great. That's great. I said, now, what is, what is, what's the significance of that? He said, well, God wants me to know that's how he started. Already, two weeks. Yeah. And like I said, he's grown up around these things. Well, what he needed is he needed another voice outside of his family to 
reinforce these truths. That's how the body of Christ works. Yeah. Right. right now, fortunately, the clinician that he works with is a minimalist. She wants, she uses the minimum, absolutely bare minimum of drugs she feels are necessary to keep his symptoms managed. So I'm very, very grateful for that. And so are they. That tells me that there's a lot that God can and will be able to do in this. I think you, this, this is such a good example um, or case study because this child was raised, or he's not a child, this young man was raised in a Christian household, even though he was adopted, right? He, he was born into a, a household of believers and he's heard these scriptures throughout his life, but this is to apply them directly to your circumstances or to understand the transforming power of them can be a new process as you go through soul care, as you really understand the word and you understand what the power of those words, you know, I grew up in a, in a same kind of household. I grew up going to church every Sunday, you know, church again on Wednesdays, celebrating all the, the, the holidays, only listening to Christian music, all that stuff. And then as an adult, you know, life was harder than I thought. And I faced struggle and I had setback and I had significant loss and I had all these things. And it's interesting because it got to a place for me where the words in the scriptures I had heard so often, they, it didn't mean much. It didn't mean much. It was like, yeah, I know God died on the cross for me. I know I'm, you know, he washed away my sins. It was like, yeah, I've heard that since I was five, but I need help. <laughs> I need more help. I need something more. And it took this, it took soul care. It took this process. It took I'm packaging this with someone else. It, it, it took understanding where I was broken in my reflection of the, of my, you know, being created in God's image for those words to now bring hope for them to be powerful and not just words that I've read for my entire life. And so I think it's, I think it's interesting because it, this isn't just monumental for someone who finds and becomes, finds the Lord and, and gets saved later in life, life. I mean, most of the examples I have of people that are chronically dealing with depression are in the church. So I yeah. mean, yeah. Right. I mean, this goes to show that we it doesn't it's not isolated to the non-believers. It's isolate. It's it's a problem we deal with in society globally, yeah. understanding how to work through the loss. Yeah. And and you, you said something that's really important. You said you said you knew all those words, but there's there's you, their meaning, their significance had been lost. Mm -hmm. That's what so biblical soul care brings mm -hmm. it's not just the word but the meaning and significance of what the word has to say right yeah right. it's like almost in a way they were they when you grow up like that it i don't want to say in a way sensationalized where you're not you're just kind of numb to it but then when you do work in soul care and you're like no like let's get down to what this really means and unpacking it and and realizing like these are why these words were written for right. God to bring healing and truth and hope. Um, and not until so, in, in a soul care type situation, do you yeah. realize the impact of that? Absolutely. Okay. And you also, you know, you, you hit on the saturation that you gave him a verse to saturate on. And I think that that is something, you know, important for everyone who's listening to understand because this, the, this gentleman in particular that we've been talking about, if he had heard the opposite of God's truths for his life, and those had been what he had saturated on most of his days, because we're always, you know, you always say we're always saturated on something. We're always set, we're always thinking about something. Things are always running through our head. But if if those are self doubt and lack of self worth and and the lies that we've let the enemy you know lead us to believe, then the only way to disrupt those thoughts is to saturate on the wholeness of His Word and the truths of His Word, and that's through the Scripture saturation. And so you mentioned you know He says it out loud, and and I think that out loud is just key because it breaks up those thoughts. You know, if I'm thinking, if I'm going through a self deprecating moment of the day, and I'm I'm caught in these lies. 
if I verbally say a scripture that God's put on my heart, or if I'm reading the word and I'm reading it out loud, it does break up my thoughts and it breaks up the lies that have just compounded and, and filled my mind for so long. So I just wanted to hit on the saturation because it's it's definitely a key to breaking up the pattern that we find ourselves in of, of negative thoughts. Yeah. And he is sad. He has things to be sad over. Yeah. Like he, he, had, <clears throat> he was doing an internship on a job and one of the guys there was just nothing but mean to him. That hurts. That makes you sad. It's it's appropriate to be sad over that. It's appropriate to be wounded over somebody being a jerk to you. Yeah. That's not bad or wrong. The thing is, is that medication isn't what the end, what you need to resolve that. Yeah. Right. Thing is, is that he hasn't been taught the the, the skill set he needs to be able to handle those things with God. Yeah. And that's that's what he and I are going to work on. Yeah. Let's talk about the other gal real quick. Okay, 20 years. This gal's a solid believer, right? 20 years seeing the same therapist, diagnosed with major depressive disorder and an anxiety disorder, right? And has she ever been suicidal? Yes. Okay. Well, sure, right? I I have not yet, I've yet to talk to anybody who's been what, what I would call dynamically depressed. I don't call it major depre depressive disorder or clinically depressed. I'm talking about dynamically depressed. There's a lot of sadness. There's a heavy weight. There's a crushed spirit, right? I've, I've yet to talk to anybody who's been in those that dark place for any length of time that didn't consider the end. my life ending would make this go away, right? I mean, that's a logical conclusion. To, to come to it's not crazy this actually makes a lot of sense right <clears throat> and i'm not condoning suicide of course but it makes sense that a person would get to that place sure. anyway <clears throat> but all of these things going on not being able to really address the loss the legitimate loss of safe healthy family because of the horrible things that were done to her when she was a child and then she got married and there were horrible things done to her in the marriage. And the counsel she kept getting was just stay in it. It'll get better, you know, from the church and from her counselor. But it's not. You're, 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 dealing, you're dealing with somebody who is an abuser. That's, I mean, that's who they are. Well, that's such a gross violation of God's design for relationship. You want to talk about a crushed spirit. You want to talk about deep sorrow. Every day, all day, you live in that state. Yeah, that could be called depression for sure. But what if it's what is it's being pressed down? Mm -hmm. Their humanity, their vibrancy, their identity in Christ, their humanity, all of those things are the things that are being mashed down. So yeah, their emotions are going to go right along with it. But medication has never been the answer for her. Wow, that's that's um to say someone's humanity is pressed down. That's that evokes a lot of emotion. It makes you sad, doesn't it? Yeah. Very sad, or even their vibrancy to yes. that's what's going on. That's what a person is struggling with, is that loss. That's why they're so sad. Mm -hmm. That's why there's deep sorrow. Well, and I think Kimberly mentioned it earlier, but to to then tell someone, you know, hang in there and just take some medication, how overwhelmingly destitute they must feel because it sounds that there's no hope. You know, they they're trying to reach out. No one has given them any any source of refuge. No, no one is able to offer them any guidance that helps them work through this and instead it feels more of a bro something's wrong with them for not being able to stick in there for their partner you know if it's a spouse like you need to be a better wife and and deal with this you know he's coping he's dealing with things um versus no he's abusing you it's an abusive situation you should get out you know so that's just deep despair that that she would be having to to deal with yeah i can understand that part of that is that's the number one that's the number one most common advice from the church 
to women who are in those situations. That's a whole nother episode we'll talk to Julie Ganshaw about. But um, yeah, um, it's something that she and I deal with often and the reasons for that. But So now you go to the place that's supposed to give you God's wisdom and God's help. And you're told, suck it up, buttercup. Mm -hmm. Is that really God's design? No, it isn't. It really is not. So let's talk about when somebody has gotten, they are medicated, they are in despair. And let's say they get to a point where they don't find soul care. They don't find biblical counseling. And now um, they've attempted suicide. Um, what do you say? It's not committed suicide. It's completed. Completed suicide. Um, because you're going to attempt it, right? And you have, you'll have failed attempts. And then you'll have a completed attempt eventually. So let's say you're dealing with somebody now who's coming to your, to your care who has attempted suicide. and. Um, what would be, how would you, how would you bring comfort to that person when you, when you see them? The first thing I would say is that the, where you are right now, this sense of unbearable pain, uh, hopelessness, helplessness, powerlessness, even sense of worthlessness, that seems insurmountable, is a horrible place to be. And from inside that construct, it would make the most sense to just end your life because that would put an end to the pain. Okay. That's what the internal logic of suicide says. This makes the most sense. Thing is, the, the, the internal logic of that doesn't take into consideration the rest of what is real and true. The focus is very, very narrow. And there are a lot of people who think that my approach is wrong. But hundreds of times I've sat with people who have been at that place. I said, okay, well, you seem really committed to resolving this problem by ending your own life. Right? I mean, what, what you did Saturday night makes it really clear that you're pretty determined. And they said, yeah. I said, okay, well, let's talk about what's next. What do you mean? Well, when we leave this planet, the very next thing is we stand before God and we have our exit interview. So what I want to do is make sure you're ready for that. See, I'm not going to try to dissuade them away from the suicide. Mm -hmm. You have so much to live for. No, I want to prepare you for death. I want to prepare you for what's next. If you're really that determined, so let's get you ready for that, if that's really where you're going to end up, right? And there's a there's a, a method to my madness in this, and it's been demonstrated time and time and time again why it's effective. But they say, well, what do you mean? I say, well, the very first question God is going to ask you when you stand before him is, what did you do with my son? Now, if you got the right answer for that, the rest of the interview continues. But if you don't have the right answer for that, the interview's over. So let's get you ready for that question. Well, I believe in Jesus. I said, well, you may think you do, but if you really believe it, what, what, tell me what that means to believe in Jesus. And well, you know what they're going to do? They're going to share the gospel with me. Okay, so I'm confused. You really believe he has the power to save you from sin, but he doesn't have the power to save you in this deep, dark place that you're in? Look at me like, well... Because the logic doesn't line up. But one thing, something else I've done by asking that, to having that conversation about sh and shifting the focus into having a reasonable conversation. Are you ready for your exit interview? Because they're caught up in the emotion of what they feel. And that's become, has become the, the number one thing that they're mulling over. It's all of those dark emotions, all that hopelessness and everything that goes with it. So what actually happens is Instead of being caught up in the emotion, what, if I ask you a question, what happens to your mind? What does your mind do? It starts thinking. It's doing it right now. It's looking for an answer, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> See? <laughs> so then I said, well, help, okay, I'm confused. Help me understand here. If I ask somebody for help, 
right? They're going to seek to try to be helpful. This is this is how human beings are. So we've shifted the focus. We've got them thinking a little bit rationally. We got them thinking about how to be helpful. Help me understand, because these things don't go together. So help me understand them. I'm not. I'm not saying anything negative to them or about them. Okay, because you have to understand that this person has become so convinced that they are the problem. They've actually become embittered toward themselves. Which in in light of our conversation makes absolute sense that someone would feel that they are the problem because they have been told nothing else except for grin and bear it, take this medication, you've got chemical imbalances going on, nothing that is, you shouldn't be sad, you know? All of these things that are making them think, well, I am sad. Why? What's wrong with me? I do have to take medication. Why can't I just be happy? I had, you know, why can't I get over this? Why can't I just get over this? Why can't I, you know? So yeah, they, they, there's no surprise now why they are caught up in this belief that they are the problem, which is just heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to remember that suicide is rooted in significant false beliefs right right it's also a sinful act but it's multi-causal there's there's a lot of things that have led up led a person to get to this place the pain is real we have to acknowledge that we we don't dare say well you don't you shouldn't feel that way or it's not that bad it is that bad for them don't just disavow that don't disqualify that what were you saying, Kimberly? I wanted to say, let's. How would you comfort a family? Let's say. Wow. So we, we can acknowledge that the pain is very real, and they and and the person who completed suicide um, felt that that was the best life would life would be better, and anybody around them would be better off with them not existing anymore. And then now a family member comes to you how do you and they're seeking some type of comfort or understanding or you know there's all these emotions they're angry at the person um then also taking on like responsibility yeah how do you so how do you help someone walk through that the very first thing that suicide survivors struggle with is how did i miss this i should have seen this Right. So now they're going to blame themselves somehow, uh, believing that they were somehow omniscient and sovereign to be able to know everything and be able to cause this person to not make that decision. So now they're putting an undue responsibility on themselves. But it, it also seems to not make sense. So they're trying to make sense of something that seems senseless. And remember, the internal logic of suicide doesn't conform to the lo- logic of regular life. So that's why it seems senseless, right? Um, They're going to struggle with um, the stigma that goes with having someone in your family and their own life. Um, Because I should have seen this. Other people could say, well, why didn't you see this? That's our assumption, right? There's a stigma that goes with that. Because part of that is, well, if one person in your family suicides, other people in your family are going to suicide. You people are now not safe for anybody type thing. That's that's a myth. That's not true. Yeah. If somebody in your family su- uh, completed suicide, it's more likely that it'll since the film has been broken, it's more likely that it'll be considered, but not necessarily that it's more likely for suicide to be completed. Um, but also understanding that um, the the second biggest question we get other than why didn't I see it? Is where are they now? Those are the two number one questions that we get. So as far as you have to understand, the reason you didn't see it is because your loved one was not able to communicate what they were feeling in a way that others could interpret, could see or understand, because they themselves didn't understand it. And I said, as far as where they are now, um, I don't, I tell them, I do not follow the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church that says that this is a mortal sin from which there's no possibility of repentance. 
because murder is a mortal sin and you cannot that's why it's called suicide self-murder right and so um there's no way to repent of to be forgiven for murdering yourself because you're dead right so that's where the idea came from i said i don't hold to that view Do, was this person in their right mind when they ended their own life right well i don't believe so i don't believe they were connected with reality and so god knows what that person's whether that person ever had surrendered their heart and life to christ and them getting to the place where they despair, even of life. Okay. That's a crisis of faith. I don't see anywhere in scripture where a person is condemned for eternity for a crisis of faith that they don't win. Because they're struggling with their faith. Okay. Now, God knows whether a person is qualified for heaven or not. So what we're going to do is we're going to trust in the wisdom, the justice, and the righteous grace of God. That if this person had surrendered their heart and life to Christ, he that person is with them now. Okay. If that hadn't happened, then we can't say that they are with him. But he's the only one who really knows whether they ever did or didn't. So we're going to focus on the righteous justice and grace of God. That's what we're going to focus on. Remember, God does not desire anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So that's was his desire for that person. And if they ever got to that place, God accepts that. That's what we're going to hold to. God's not looking for ways to disqualify people. He's looking to get people qualified, and that's through repentance. Again, did they repent? Did they surrender their heart and life to Christ? We're going to trust that they did. Right? The, from what you described? Okay. Now, I will tell you this. Up to this point, as many years as I've been doing this, I have never had anyone who attempted suicide that I counseled post attempt that ever went back and completed suicide later. Well, now, I feel like you needed to also say that because you, you have a very unconventional. I do. Path, so that's, that's good for. But you, you know that one, one in five licensed clinicians have had clients complete suicide. And I, if you survey, the biblical counseling community, community, you will not find those kind of numbers. I think that's evidence of our goal with sharing this is we feel like this is where often people go to find true hope and help when the world has failed them. Yeah. That's because the world doesn't have God's answers. Mm -hmm. Only God's people do. Right. And that may sound prideful, but it's not. It's just the facts. It's just the reality. Yeah. Right? It's just the reality. And so the thing is, is that there's no quick fix for crushed spirit. There's no quick fix for I believe that the best solution to this is ending my own life. But there are anchor points that we can establish in that person's heart and mind with loving truth. And that's what they need more than anything, because that's what's missing at this point. And it has to be more than intellectual. It has to be something that they can actually experience. And that's what we bring in soul care. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, I think that, um, you know, that's why soul care is so beneficial is like what you're saying is coming one anothering with one another, connecting. Um, and as you say, words matter and properly interpreted scripture and giving that hope and um, and, and knowing that it's it's we're not going to take care of a symptom. We're going to get down to the core to the core wounding of it. We're going to be here and walk walk through it with you. Right. Yeah, I, yeah, I was just going to say, it just, soul care relies on 
bringing the everything to light, right? It, it relies on not shielding ourselves or ignoring the pain because the more that we do that, we're no better than the world's attempt to heal. We have to bring it to light because within the pain are lies that the enemy is telling us our truths and we have to bring those to light in order for us to ultimately walk in the truths. And it, we have to acknowledge yeah. the pain, the hurt. We have to bring it out. But we don't leave you stirring in it because we need to bring it forward so that we can expose it for what it is. And then we can provide the hope, which is in his his word that gives gives you a chance to walk in freedom. Well, when we're talking about depression and suicide, we're talking about severe hopelessness yeah. and helplessness yeah. in that hopelessness. So that's what they need. They need yeah. to know that there is hope and that they can actually be helped. Yes. One thing I feel like we didn't necessarily hit on is more of what I would call like the functioning depressed or the um because you know the DSM called out those nine symptoms. Yeah. And there are often times that you, you know, when family members are like, how did I not see it? It's because they didn't display those type of symptoms. They weren't um they, you know, they didn't have extreme loss of weight or gain of weight. They um they didn't talk about the death you know like so you think of the ones where it doesn't seem as externally apparent that someone is you know necessarily depressed do you feel like there is a difference or do you feel like really it's all the same and people just have become so great at putting on an act but really you know or, or what do you what do you think what, how would you can I, can I add to that question, Warren? Yeah. It's, let's say like the people um, who are always so jovial and so happy, right? And Robin all- Williams. Yeah. Right. There was a, I remember at preschool, um, he had the most jovial uh, teacher and I could, I was like, oh, I hope he gets this teacher for kindergarten. He taught basketball. He was so great with the kids. And then we got a message over the summer that he took his own life. And it was so shocking to the community. Yeah. This is why one anothering relationship and healthy Christian community is so vital. We're not meant to be isolated. We're not meant to be on our own. <clears throat> We're meant to be able to encourage, to be encouraged and to encourage each other, to be able to be honest with what's going on in our hearts and our minds. And the, think about the more familiar you get with someone, the more uh, tuned into things that go get out of sorts, things that don't seem normal. They don't seem themselves, right? We need community, not just surfacey community, but deep community. Yeah, yeah. But so you, you, the thing is, if you're paying attention. People like that will say things that indicate that there's a deep sadness under underneath. And if they try to joke it away, don't don't fall for that. Pay attention to what to what they said, what they shared. Give it weigh it. Say this is a valid this is a valid expression of of things that are going on with this person. Say you know it made me sad for you when I heard you say this, and. It, I'd love to talk through that with you anytime you want to. Right? I think that's... Well, think let's that's Robin Williams, for example. I remember watching him years and years and years ago, and there was always something that seemed underlying sad about him. Right? <clears throat> but almost like he was trying to make himself feel better. Mm-hmm. There was something deep and sad underneath it all. Well, clearly he was. Right. But that's the thing is that 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 was something that even, you know, I, I mean, we're talking, what was it, the 70s when they did uh, Mork and Mindy and all that stuff? Right. Because I can remember that there in his humor and stuff. And yeah, he's hilarious, um, very quick, 
but underneath that there there was always an there was always a sad edge to everything right and it was like it wasn't seen or it wasn't noticed or it was minimized or you know he never he never experienced an, an opportunity to feel really safe to share those things or you know safe in his own but again and i'm not saying that his his suicide could have been prevented or would have been if if only this or only that what i'm saying is paying attention to those types of things don't second guess that check that you have say there's something here that's not right something here that's not not jiving for me follow that up well and i think that takes a you know a desire and it also puts an onus we have to care about having authentic genuine relationships with people you know we we have to try to get past the surface of what people are saying and just to your point you know when when someone is making a joke and it doesn't you're at first you're kind of like that was that was a bit far out there you know that's i that's that's interesting you know don't just let it roll up your shoulders just to, to what you said go back and be like hey that's are you is are you okay because that's kind of an intense joke tell yeah. me more like are you you know but it takes it takes an authentic desire to care to care about people really to build relationships and connection connections and I think asking the uncomfortable questions that other people who may not ask you know or that 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 people don't want to get into but no that's a Good point. Sad. Well, well if, if and again, being in a healthy community is really important, and being invested in the one and others. Yeah, it's not just it's it's not really optional. It's a mandate for us, right? We need to be in each other's lives. We need to be in each other's business a little bit. Yeah, we not do. because we're being nosy and controlling, but because we really care, and people need to because, know that. Yeah. They're, 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 people we need to that we care there was a study that came out about how um just talking about you know dopamine oxytocin serotonin and you know how everything is on screens right now and 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 because everything screens social media there's a like teenage suicide rate is up 500 percent yep and so yeah so there's a study that comes out where you know, we know that there's a dopamine, you get dopamine hits by looking at your phone. And then I'm, I'm curious, um, you probably already know this, but they were saying, but when actually when you're talking to a person in real life, having a real authentic connection, then the oxytocin and the serotonin, all three are working together. And I thought that was pretty profound mm-hmm. where, um, if you kind of, if you look at that and you look at God's design and then you realize how really important authentic connection in person is, you know? Yeah, very much, very much. And that goes back to God created us to be in safe, caring, loving, nurturing, healthy community. Yeah. That's what he created. That's He created us for that. Right. And so when that's lacking, we suffer. And so um, I think that I think for in our show notes, we want to make sure that we include a passage of scripture, which is a real promise. And it's uh, Psalm 34, verses 17 and 18. He says, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and rescues them from all their troubles. In verse 18, I love it. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. What an incredible encouragement. Incredible. It is. See, the Bible talks about this stuff robust. <laughs> you just have to know where it is. You have to know where it is. And I think, you know, as we talked about before, it has to become relevant and alive for people you know but it and that only comes with someone doing that you know the more 
that it just feels like old words, or, you know, or old stories and, and not applicable to you. But that also comes back to understanding your identity in Christ, because the word was written for you for today, and not just for people back in the day. And so you have to understand that too. So interesting how it all comes full circle. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Soul Care Podcast. We pray this has been a blessing and an encouragement for you. We want to leave you with four thoughts to reflect on. Is your identity in Christ or something else? How well do you understand the true nature and character of God? How much confidence do you have in who God is? And how does all of this impact what you are struggling with today? If you desire to learn more, check out the show notes for more resources and information. And please don't forget, you matter to God.